Hello, I'm Kim Warren, and in this presentation, I'd like to explain how the strategy dynamics process can be used for business analysis. And to do that, we're going to go through an example where there's plenty of public information. The low fare airline, Ryanair. Now, this uh, example actually features in the strategy dynamics essentials ebook, which you'll find on Amazon. What we're going to cover in this presentation is, first of all, a brief explanation about why we need this approach. And then the bulk of the presentation will actually go through how to use the process to build up the core strategy model of this uh, simple case. And we'll mention at the end that you can add around that some additional frameworks and may really need to add those additional frameworks if you're really going to push business analysis to the fullest extent it can. You can find Strategy Dynamics Essentials by me, Kim Warren, on Amazon, and you'll find information also on our online course at strategydynamics.com slash sdcourse. So first of all, to explain, Strategy Dynamics as an application of this much more general method called System Dynamics, which has been around since the 1950s, but we're applying it to strategic issues. In this case, there happen to be corporate issues, but the method does work in all kinds of other domains, environment, healthcare, and so on. The method is evidence-based and quantitative. We're actually putting data in about how the system works and performs. There are various other styles of systems thinking. There's quite a lot of these other styles of systems thinking, and it's important not to confuse system dynamics with those other styles. As I say, this method is evidence-based and quantitative. Um, and lastly, I should just point out that the method was actually developed to help improve strategy implementation. So it, its target was corporate uh, management. Why are we choosing Ryanair as the example for this demonstration? Well, first of all, it's a simple, single business firm. It hasn't got lots of different business units doing different things. Secondly, it's a business pretty much everyone understands. We've all flown on airlines, even if we haven't flown on this one. And it's pretty clear how it works. The third reason is that it's a quite rare example where an awful lot of data about the business itself, not just the financials, but all the stuff of which the business is made up, is actually reported. We know about their aircraft numbers, we know about their uh, routes they're flying, we know how many kilometers their aircraft fly. Lots and lots of business data is reported. And lastly, there are many identical model firms. There are dozens of other low fare airlines operating apparently similar business models, but with vastly different performance results. Now, a problem we face is that the strategy tools and business analysis tools that we have don't really help connect the strategy to the performance outcomes. So a, a common way of thinking about strategy is what positioning a business chooses. So Ryanair chooses to serve primarily cost-focused travellers with low-priced, reliable travel to very large numbers of destinations using low or zero-cost airports and new efficient aircraft. The problem is what happens between that statement of strategic positioning and the profit growth that actually emerges out on the right-hand side of this picture. And no amount of financial analysis alone can explain this success or give a sense of the future prospects for the business. The trouble is that this statement of the company's strategic positioning cannot explain that performance. And we know it can't explain it because more than 50 other airlines have tried the same thing in the same market. Most of those 50 have failed. And Ryanair's own positioning has not changed in 15 years. So that cannot be an explanation for how that profit growth chart has been delivered on the right hand side. And there are very similar limitations with various ways in which people try to describe business models, value propositions, and other strategy tools. And the reason they can't do this is because they are usually based on static foundations, correlations between performance and various things that might explain performance. And uh, many of them provide a completely qualitative treatment in any case of you know, the leading business model textbook for example, doesn't include a single number about the performance of any of the cases that it describes. What has been happening in this case, though, is that success has come from building and sustaining quite specific resources to win and keep the customers who drive the sales. 
What do we mean by building resources in this case? Well, they add cities to serve, they add or close airports, they add or close routes, they hire and retain staff, they buy and sell aircraft, and they set fares and marketing. And all of those things have to happen and happen well to win and retain the customers to deliver the profit growth in that chart. And if we look to the future, the same thing has got to happen if they're going to continue growing customers and continue to grow that profit. So what is this strategy dynamics process? Well, there are four main steps with some supplementary pieces on the end. The first is to specify the past and desired future performance of the organization over time. The second is to work out how changes to resources drive that performance, and we take care to properly define and quantify those resources. The third step is to show how those resources accumulate over periods of time, as I mentioned earlier, quite often there's a quite long periods of time. And the fourth step is to assess how interdependent actually works and depends on the decisions that management takes. Now, when you put those four steps together, what you end up with is a quantified, rigorous description of the system that actually works and drives the organization's growth and performance. And from that, we can figure out what the actions and decisions taken by management actually do and how that may result in strong performance. It turns out that's not quite enough. There are quite a lot of extra little pieces that can be and, and often need to be added around that core system. Ryanair, for example, wants customers who fly more often rather than less often. They want uh, to have airports where lots of people use the airport rather than fewer. So the quality of the resources is important. There's a customer development pipeline that may be involved and pipelines for staff and other resources. There is competition to worry about. There are intangible factors to worry about. There are skills and capabilities to worry about. And the method does include extensions to deal with all of those uh, considerations. But we're going to concentrate mostly on the four main steps that get you to this picture of the core system. So what do we mean by specifying past and desired future performance over time? Well, that's really very simple. It's this time chart. It's, in this case, what has happened to EBITDA, the, this particular uh, version of profit, over the past five years and what might happen to it over the coming four years. And it's important to recognize that history matters here. It gives us information about how the system works and during that history, there will have been decisions taken that are having an impact right now on current performance and will continue to have impact on performance into the future. So the second uh, part of this is a view of what a strong future actually looks like in which the system continues to perform well. And what does a poor future look like in which the system starts to fail? And it's important to recognize that not everything here is under our own control. You know, this company, like many others, was not immune to the recession that happened in 2008-2009. As it happens, this company survived that recession quite well, but it actually drove other airlines into losses or failure. And we'll see a little bit about how that happened in a moment. So you'll notice that we had a time chart on that performance over time. And uh, time charts are the fundamental tool of the method. And for every one of these, whether it's a performance outcome in terms of profit or whether it's other outcomes like service quality or input such as hiring rates, there is once again a history. There is a, a version of these charts going into the future where the situation gets worse. So here, if we carry on at the low rate of hiring, we can expect that service quality will continue to get worse and stay at a low level. And it will take some time to fix. So even if we suddenly turned on the hiring right now, uh, by the time we have trained those people and they've got experience with delivering service to our customers, it will take some time for that service quality to improve. And the implication of this is that any performance that you're interested in is moving on a trajectory over time. So we can only understand it if we take this perspective of looking at how that change over time is actually happening. And that applies, as I say, to performance, but also to the inputs that we make and the outcomes that uh, result from those inputs. The next thing to do is to work out how that performance depends on changes in the organization's resources. If it's profit that we're trying to explain, this is where we start. We start from the income statement 
And all we're going to do is lay out those numbers in a causal structure. So here's the company's uh, EBITDA profit, which comes from its revenue minus its cash operating costs. That revenue comes from the revenue it gets from selling fares and the revenue it gets from selling ancillary products and services like transport to the airport and so on. That fare revenue comes from the number of passenger journeys it sells multiplied by the average fare that it charges for those journeys. On the uh, cost side, well, those costs come from the cost of staff, the cost of aircraft, airports, routes, and marketing and other items. That's pretty much everything on the cost side, except for depreciation. Now, if that causal relationship between the profit that comes out the right-hand side and the stuff going in on the left-hand side is true for that particular year, the 12 months to March 2012, is also true of every single period of the company's performance. So here is that same time chart of the company's EBITDA profit and the time chart for the revenue and operating costs that have given rise to the profit history up to 2012 and could plausibly give rise to the profit projection out to 2017. Here is the plausible projection of what could happen to fair revenue and ancillary revenue going out to 2017, along with the history in the blue section of the charts up to 2012. Here is the history of the company's actual sales of passenger journeys and the average fare that it's been charging, and once again, some plausible projections. Now, here's the critical question, which conventional analysis doesn't yeah, usually deal with, but is fundamental to understanding future performance. Where does that number of passenger journeys come from? It comes from the number of customers that use the airline and the frequency with which they use it. Now, as I say, we're not doing anything different back as far as the passenger journey number than we were doing in the previous uh, chart. All we're doing is adding time charts to it. Now, the important thing to realize here is that Passenger journeys comes from the number of customers who use the airline multiplied by their journey frequency. But that is not reported by the company. It's probably known internally. So what I've shown here are plausible estimates. But this relationship is absolutely critical. 75.8 million people flying with the airline once per year is not the same as 15.2 million people flying with the company five times per year. Uh, that difference is really very important. But before we move on, I should just uh, return to what it is we're uh, analysing here. I'm only going in this analysis as far as EBITDA profit. But everything I'm saying, everything I'm describing, can be extended to the full income statement and to the analysis of the company's uh, cash flow. Now, armed with this picture, we can already assess part of this company's strategy. Up at the top left-hand side, we know that the recession hit customer travel. So it's plausible that in the year to March 2010, which is largely 2009, of course, there was a significant drop in the journey frequency of people using this airline. What did the company do? It cut fares sharply during 2009. The result of that was that, um, unlike other airlines, it actually captured many more customers, probably from those other airlines. This enabled it to sustain sales growth, but there was quite a loss of margin and therefore quite a lot of profit in the year to March 2010. The uh, advantage, though, was that the company got payback from that strategy in the next two years, picking up customers from other airlines as they fell into trouble and uh, went bust. Now, what this picture tells us is not just what was done, but it tells us how much of it was done and with what results. We know what happened to the fare. If we had the data, we would know what happened to journey frequency and customer numbers. We certainly do know what happened to passenger journeys in total, and we can explain all the logic through to what happened to the company's profit. We can do the same kind of uh, thing with the uh, supply side resources of the business. Here's the explanation for the costs of the business, and we can see that the total cash operating costs has been the sum of those cost items over all the years of its history. Staff costs come from the number of staff we employ. 
aircraft costs come from the number of aircraft that we're operating. Airport costs come from the number of airports we serve, and the uh, route costs come from how many routes we operate. This is air traffic control predominantly driving the costs of operating each route. I mentioned earlier that the reason we use this example is because such a lot of the business data is actually available and these resources are all reported by the company at year end and quarter end. You can find out how many staff, aircraft, airports and route the company actually had. And that's not always the case with uh, company reports. So if we put this together, what we've got is a complete explanation of Ryanair performance driven by its resources. Now, we have moved on a year since these 2012 results, and uh, if you check out the company's uh, results for the year to March 2013, you'll find that they were just slightly less than are projected here. And once again, I should emphasize these are annual numbers, but you can do exactly the same analysis with quarterly data, or if you had it, with monthly data, or even weekly, if that's what you uh, wanted to do, and if you had access to the data. Now, this is not just a diagram of how the business works. It is a working quantitative mathematical model. It's not complicated in principle. The maths just follows the logic that we've uh, explained up to this point in time. And it is the first of a series of models about Ryanair, which you'll find at this link. You just need any latest version browser to be able to uh, use the model. Now, in the case of this airline, we've seen that, that customers are the people who travel with the airline. The capacity is the number of aircraft in the seats, the staff are the pilots, crew and ground staff, and the product range is the routes that it offers, and the company has cash. Now, those turn out to be pretty universal, tangible resources that apply to almost any business. I just listed here what those are in different uh, contexts for a manufacturing company, for a retailer, car maker, law firm, or pharmaceuticals company. Every one of those has got customers, they've got capacity, they've got staff, a product range, and cash. However, some kinds of business need variations on this standard list, and I'll just give uh, two or three examples of those. In the oil and gas industry, in the mining industry, generally speaking, when you're dealing with, with uh, natural resource businesses, it is often the case that you have no identifiable customers. You ship your ore off to some market or your oil and gas gets traded in some market and you don't have a relationship with specific customers. You might in some cases have contract relationships with customers, but in many cases, the product simply goes into a commodity market where it gets traded. This uh, case also brings up uh, an additional kind of resource that's pretty critical, and that's the reserves that the oil company or the mining company has got. So we'd need to have information about, the, uh, about those reserves, and generally, of course, we, we do. In the case of a car maker, uh, this brings in the need for um, an additional kind of resource in the form of intermediaries. The car maker doesn't sell directly to the customer, they sell to car dealers who then sell on to consumers, and clearly, those car dealers are a critical resource for any car maker. And car makers have also got a critical resource in the form of the suppliers who provide them with the components and uh, raw materials they need. Uh, lastly, in the case of professional firms, physical capacity is actually not so important. The capacity of a law firm, for example, consists of the lawyers that it employs. The capacity of an, of a, an architectural firm consists of the architects that it employs. Physical capacity in the form of offices is somewhat relevant, but the critical capacity issue is the professional staff themselves. In the case of physical capacity, there is a question of how exactly we should specify it. We could list the actual numbers of things that the, uh, the business has got, the number of machines in the, air, in the manufacturing company, the number of aircraft in the airline, the number of lawyers in a law firm, and so on. But very often, we're more interested in what the output potential is. How many units can this manufacturer's machine produce? How many passengers per day can the aircraft carry? Um, particularly in the case of informa information technology, it isn't really very helpful to um, talk in terms of how many servers or routers the company has, what we're interested in. For example, is how many transactions per hour the capacity can deal with or how many terabytes of storage we've got. Next, we need to understand how those resources accumulate over time. Now, this is a, a critical mechanism in 
business performance. What we mean here is something very similar to what happens with your bank account. The amount of money in your bank is the sum of all the money you ever paid in minus all of the money you ever paid out. So if this bank balance has gone up from $400 to 450 and we paid 250 in, then we must have paid 200 out. So in this case, both the inflow and the outflow are running quite fast. Now, people already get this. Anyone who's got any clue at all about what's going on with their personal bank account understands this. And it's just the same principle as we use with the balance sheet and cash flow statement from a company. The important thing to recognise, though, is that this mechanism applies to all resources, not just cash. So here is the stock of Ryanair's customers. And last year we ended with 13.8 million. This year we ended the year with 16.5 million. And that implies that we won more than we lost. So plausible estimates for how many we won and lost are that we had an inflow of 4.3 million. That's 4.3 million new people started flying with the airline during the last 12 months. Meanwhile, 1.6 million customers stopped using the airline. Um, now, those numbers are not actually reported by the company, but as I say, they are plausible estimates as to what those numbers could be. And why those numbers are so important is that these three cases are completely different. In all three cases, the numbers of customers we start and end the year with are exactly the same, but the win rates and loss rates are completely different, and that difference really matters a lot. It would be fundamentally different if the company had won 10 million customers and lost 7.3 million. Yeah, at some point, for example, the company's certainly going to run out of potential customers who might want to, to fly with them. That's almost certainly not the case here. Scenario A is probably somewhat nearer the truth. Uh, we, we just don't know. So here is the time chart version of that same picture. We've got customers being won on the left-hand side of the stock at the top left, and we've got customers being lost. And those win rates and loss rates are changing over time. So this is how customer gains and losses could have led to that development of the number of customers using the airline. And this is not reported by the company. They are plausible estimates. It's not reported pretty much by any company, but it's fundamental to their performance. And it has big implications for customer quality here. How loyal are these customers? How frequently do they fly with the airline? Again, these are annual numbers, but you could do exactly the same analysis with quarterly or monthly data if you had access to it. Once again, this is not just a diagram, it's a working model. And if you go to this uh, URL, uh, you can actually play with those uh, flow rates of customers being won and lost. Same applies to the supply side resources of any business. The number of staff has changed in the way that it has up to 2012 because of the net change in staff numbers being added to the business. So in most of those years, the airline added a number of, of staff. Uh, but in one year, it actually uh, had fewer staff. And in the case of staff, we get roughly what we want, more or less what we want. It. If the uh, management says, go out and hire over a thousand people, uh, the HR team can probably go out and probably get something like the thousand people that we want. That won't always be the case if you're operating in a business that is critically dependent on certain key staff groups. You might struggle much more to get the number of people you need. The other resources is actually rather easier, though. You simply get exactly what you want, exactly when you want it. I want 60 more aircraft next year. I simply go and order them, and Boeing and Airbus will be falling over themselves to provide those aircraft for you. If you want to open a certain number of airports, the cities where you might want to fly to will be very pleased to welcome you and uh, give you access to their local airport. And if you want to start flying, 196 more routes this year than you did last year you simply choose to do that and that's what you get and these flow rates too are in the uh, working model for uh, for Ryanair now, this has important implications uh, these these resource flows it has implications for example for staff quality turnover amongst staff makes a very big difference indeed to the experience level and productivity of staff for example as I say, not so critical in this case, but it would be very critical indeed 
in uh, organisations that are dependent on the skills and experience of their staff. The change in the physical capacity of the business has implications for the quality of that capacity, which is only evident from gains and losses that take place. I mean, in this case, Ryanair's fleet is the youngest aircraft fleet in the market. That means that the aircraft are extremely re reliable and highly efficient. Uh, for a company who buys and sells aircraft much more slowly, the average age will be much higher and the reliability and efficiency will be lower. And there's a very direct link from those decisions to the company's capital spend and realizations that it gets when it sells its capacity. Uh, and that's only evident if the company reports the actual gains and the actual losses of those physical units. Now, to be fair, that is reported in this case, and it usually is reported, because capital employed is such an important thing about companies' performance, you will usually find that um, uh, additions to uh, capital equipment and the cost of those and the realizations that come from disposing of that equipment are usually reported. There are implications also for the quality of this company's product range. Okay, we can keep on adding more and more routes, but will we continue to get more and more customers from all of those routes that we open? We should just point out, I made a very big deal earlier on that resources drive costs. Well, actually, some resource flows drive costs as well. So cost of marketing here is, is uh, actually driving, the, in part, the uh, acquisition of customers. In this case, it's separately reported, and it's actually a very small number, but in other cases, it would be a very big number indeed. In some cases, there can be costs if you lose customers. Uh, again, probably zero in this case, but in other cases, the, it can be very costly to, uh, to lose a customer. Hiring and firing the staff is costly, and uh, those costs are probably hidden away in the staff cost category in the income statement. If you open airports, then uh, that is costly too. You've got to go and employ more staff, but that of course appears in the staff cost part of the income statement. There may be external payments you have to make to suppliers to allow you to uh, open those airports. So again, those costs are probably in the airport cost category in the income statement. There may be costs of closing the airports as well when you have to dispose of uh, any assets that are employed at, at that airport. Adding routes in this particular case is probably extremely uh, small in cost and closing routes doesn't cost you anything either. But this is the company's product range and of course in other contexts adding products to your product range can be extremely costly indeed and we only need to think about the pharmaceutical industry to appreciate that. So if these flow rates are so important to how the uh, business performs and these resources, these assets are so important, how should we be reporting them? Well I've reported them in time charts here and I'm, I'm with this stock and flow diagrammatic uh, report but here's what we normally do with resources, we've got a balance sheet. We know how much cash we have at the start of the year, we know how much cash has flowed in, we know how much cash has flowed out, and we end up with cash at the end of the year. Well, if customers are critical to sales, why do we not report gains and losses of customers in exactly the same way? Customers at the start of the quarter, customers won during that quarter, customers lost during that quarter, giving you the customers we end up with at the end of the quarter. And uh, here's one that's really very common indeed. Uh, so many companies uh, say something like staff are our most important asset in their annual report. Well, if staff are our most important asset, why are we not reporting gains and losses of those staff and doing so for key groups in the business? How many staff did we have at the start of the month? How many did we hire? How many did we lose? How many did we end up with at the end of the month? And of course, in the case of cash and staff, it's very easy to actually know what those numbers are. It's often rather more difficult in the case of customers. If you're a bank, for example, you've got a pretty good idea how many customers you've got because they've all got accounts. Um, if, if you're supplying electricity and gas to consumers and businesses, again, you know exactly how many customers you've got because every customer has uh, identifiable accounts. In other cases, though, it's actually really rather more difficult to be certain what a customer is and uh, how often they're buying from you.
But um, in cases like uh, Ryanair and other consumer related cases, you can get a pretty good idea of those numbers by doing some basic and simple uh, customer research. The same principle applies to product range and capacity. What do you have at the start of the period? What have you added? What have you lost? What do you end up with at the end of the period? So we could perfectly easily produce a customer flow statement. And here's what such a thing would look like in the case of Ryanair. Uh, for 2012, we've got the number of customers at the start of the year, the number of customers at the end of the year, and we've got the gains and losses that occurred during the year. How would you find that out? Simply ask people when they get on the plane. You know, when did you last fly with us? And the rest of this table simply provides some plausible projections uh, reflecting equally plausible future gains and losses for customers. We can do the same with staff. Ryanair isn't especially uh, dependent on critical staff groups uh, here. So this is a different example. This is an IT support firm that is definitely uh, dependent on uh, key staff. And on the right hand side, we've got another table showing staff hired, staff lost and the staff that we have at the start of each month. And from that, we could very easily generate a quarterly staff flow statement. How many staff do we have at the start of the quarter? How many hired? How many lost? How many did we end up with at the end of the quarter? So as I say, staff gains and losses are critical to service quality in this case and in many others, and therefore critical to performance. Product range flows may be important, so we'd want products launched and dropped. In the case of the airline, that's routes added and closed. And in the case of a drug company, we want to know about the number of drugs being launched and the number going off patent. Capacity flows may be critical, so what capacity has been added and scrapped, aircraft bought and sold for the airline or for a retailer, how many stores to be open and how many stores to be closed. So the fourth step to get us to this understanding of the core system is to work out how interdependence operates within the business system and what our decisions do to help the system develop. So here's where we got to for Ryanair. We've got customers flowing in and out at the top left and we've got the supply side resources such as staff being added to at the bottom left. So what we want to know now is what drives those flow rates, what drives those resource gain and resource losses. And there are just three categories of things that do that. First of all, our decisions. Secondly, there can be external factors to do with competition or market conditions. And thirdly, the existing resources in the system. And that gives rise to interdependence and feedback, which just makes life difficult. So here is an example of a decision that affected a flow rate in the case of Ryanair. As I say, that was a decision to cut the fares during 2009 so that for the year ended in March 2010, we continue to win customers. We actually lost customers in the following year because that's when we started putting our price up again. But external factors were also important. Here's what happened to consumer spending rates in Europe generally in the recession. You can see that recession in the two years of downturn in uh, 2009 and 10. Clearly that had an impact on this company's ability to, uh, to win customers. And the last thing that had an impact is the company's own decisions about the growth of its resources. So by serving more airports, we could reach more customers. By offering more routes, we could reach more customers. And that is also part of the explanation for the customer win rate. As I say, those items down there are simply decisions. We decided how many airports to add and how many routes to add. That little number in the, in the middle there about customers one, however, doesn't actually look quite right. We'll see in a little bit um, how we can correct that estimate. It's not plausible that this company won no customers in that particular year. So these decisions, external factors and existing resources also drive the loss rates. So there's the same decision about our fares and there's that same external information about changes in consumer spending. That, both of those things will have had varying impacts on the rate at which we uh, lost customers. So that customer loss rate on the right hand side also depends uh, on that decision and that external factor on the left. So it's simply not realistic to assume a uh, constant loss rate and the company could find out what that loss rate actually is 
and we've now got this revised estimate as to what the win rate would have been. The third reason, though, for losing resources is again uh, traceable back to our decisions. Here is that customer loss rate on the right hand side for this company and that's caused because we need aircraft in order to serve those customers. If we don't add enough aircraft, that's the blue lines in these charts, then our aircraft fleet is not enough and we are unable to deliver all of our flights on time and we lose some customers because of our poor punctuality. So the future loss rate in blue is higher than the future loss rate on in the red time series and that means we would end up with fewer customers at the start of each year in the blue case than we had previously in the red case. So poor on-time performance increases customer losses and that happens because we've got too few aircraft. And because our flights are getting longer, we're serving airports that are further and further away, we have to have a, an increasing ratio between the number of aircraft we operate and the number of customers that we're flying. And it's important to realize that this future problem is the result of a bad decision on our part. We simply didn't order enough aircraft to serve the number of customers that we have. Now, this company isn't dumb and simply doesn't make that mistake, but these projections for future years show how such a mistake could give rise to a lower rate of growth for the business than it would otherwise achieve. This is an, a, the next in the series of working models for the company and allows you to test the impact of aircraft purchases and staff hiring decisions on its future growth. And we mentioned earlier that these systems include feedback. We've actually got feedback here already. This is one of those feedback systems where not having enough of something uh, slows down the uh, growth of the uh, customer base. But there is the other kind of feedback to think about, which is uh, the self-reinforcing feedback that allows an organization to keep growing at, a, at an increasing rate. And in this case, it's almost certainly true that a proportion of customers start flying with this airline because other customers tell them that it's a good thing. So we have this word of mouth effect. We don't know what that is. The company probably knows or has a very good estimate for how many customers come because others recommend it. And um, that number depends on how many customers you've already got. The more customers you have, the more people there are to tell other customers that this is a good thing to do. So that customer win rate is not just dependent on the decisions, on the external factors, and on the other resources we employ. It's also dependent on the existing resources we have in the case of customers. So what this gives us is a very general principle about how a resource grows. It depends on the current resources that are in place and that set of current resources may include uh, the resource itself. And you can clearly see in cases like Facebook, for example, how very, very powerful that word of mouth effect can be in some situations. It's not always important, uh, but in, in uh, different cases, it's more or less important than in, in other cases. So I mentioned that the first four steps in this process give us this picture of the core system that drives performance. But there are also important extensions to this that, that would be needed if you're going to understand performance in some detail. And we're just going to look at one of these, which is the quality of resources. Here's that core strategic architecture. We need to understand about the quality of resources. We need to understand how resources develop through stages product development pipelines, customer pipelines, and so on. We need to understand how competition uh, works, how competition for customers operates, how competition for staff occurs. We need to understand the policy that an organization is using to guide its uh, decision making. We need to think about intangible factors like reputation and uh, staff motivation. And we need to think about capabilities. I notice here I've referred to various classes and the class numbers here refer to the classes in the strategy dynamics course and I'll uh, show you later where you can get hold of that. So each of these additional frameworks is useful on its own and as part of understanding the whole architecture, the whole performance of a business. I'll just give one example 
with the quality or attributes of resources. So here's how you would look at it. Here is the sales contribution that arises from each size group of customers for a business. And this is what we call the quality curve. So down here at the bottom left, we've got the sales that are made to the top 10% of customers. The next block is the sales that we achieve to the second decile, and then the third decile, and so on. And uh, up at the top, we've got the sales to the very smallest customers. In businesses that have got small numbers of very large customers, you might lay this out for every single customer. Now, every business should know this picture and manage it. But it's important to recognize that uh, it's profits we want out of customers, not, not sales. So you should follow this up with this picture, which is the cumulative profit contribution. We've got the profits from the most profitable customer at the bottom left, then the next most profitable customer. And at the far right, we've got the losses that we make from the worst customer in our customer base. And again, every business should know this picture and uh, use it to manage it. But it's not just quality of customers that matters. We mentioned earlier that we need to know about the quality of our staff and the quality of our product range. So in the case of our airline, one example is the quality of the airports that it serves. Now, why is that important? Well, because each airport brings with it access to potential customers. So when we open airports on the left-hand side of this diagram, each one of those gives us access to the population that lives or works around that particular airport. So here, the company has added to the pool of people it could serve every time it opens an airport. And from that, we can figure out how many more airports there might be that offer the kind of population that will give us a, a, a decent uh, amount of incremental business. And we can figure out what's happening to the quality of that portfolio of airports we serve. It looks from this data as though the company is probably still using up the potential that exists in customers around the airports it serves, but who do not currently um, already fly with the airline. And uh, we, can, we can show another example of how uh, the quality of other resources matters. This is uh, the case of Starbucks, where the quality of its stores is a critical factor. Here's what happens with companies' operating income, and you can see a very severe downturn in 2008, 2009. And a part of the reason for that is that during the previous five or six years, the company spent at least $200 million opening um, a lot of poor quality stores. It opened a lot of good stores as well, of course, but amongst those good stores, there were about 500 bad stores. You know, we know that there were 500 because that's the number the company subsequently closed. When it closed them, it then had to uh, in, in, incur further cost to shut those uh, stores down, lay off staff, um, and so on. So here's a case where the, the quality of the capacity of the business has had a very substantial impact on its performance in later years. So in this presentation, I've explained why we need strategy dynamics and I've given you this explanation about how the process is used to build up the core of a model for a business with this simple case. And I've also explained that we need additional frameworks the ebook Strategy Dynamics Essentials, which you'll find at Amazon, actually covers this core process in the first four chapters. And those additional frameworks I mentioned appear in chapters five to ten. And our online course follows exactly the same structure. So you cover the core frameworks in classes one to four, and we deal with all the additional frameworks in classes five to ten. So that's what we've uh, covered in this uh, presentation. And if you want to find out more, there's plenty of information, plenty of resources at strategydynamics.com. And there is a, a very useful discussion on the Strategy Dynamics Network, which you'll find on LinkedIn.